higher dimensions, um, um, you have more general symmetries, and you have Boltzmann theorem, which predicts massless particles. And the question you have to ask right away is, oh my goodness, what's that good for? The photons are massless. What else? And so that was problematic, as has been indicated by the earlier speakers. Now, this is where I came in. Uh, I was a student at Harvard. Nick and I uh, went to MIT together, a long, long time together, a uh, long, long time ago. We met each other for sophomore year. Uh, we worked problem sets together, and indeed we wrote our first paper together. I think it was on Richard Bowles. A uh, long, long time ago. And we talked all the time, and he uh, elected to stay at MIT, and I went to Harvard. And uh, there, my, uh, I, my thesis advisor was Wally Gilbert. Now, what's interesting about all of this is Wally Gilbert was Abdus Salam's graduate student. You see how closed all of this is. And so when I first met Abdus, he said, ah, my first grandchild. <laughs> and that was the first time I heard the expression grandchild or grand student applied to uh, generations of physicists. Uh, but anyway, Wally told me, who by the way got Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work in biology, told me that <laughs> there was this interesting examination done by Bear Kane of a four fermion model, but this time it was involving current current interaction. So it was another version of the Nambu Young Lucidio thing. And this model appeared to emulate the results of a normal quantum electrodynamics. And it was produced by a symmetry group. Now that's very disturbing, right? Because the symmetry that's broken in that model is Lorentz invariants. Uh, and he says, better take a look at this. Uh, this is very questionable. Well, I did look at it and worked it out. It wasn't easy, and not surprisingly, to those of you who know him, B.J. Lancer was right. Okay, there are some subtleties involved. I mean, I fixed up a few things, but in the end, he had it right. And uh, what happens is the Lorentz breaking just passes through untouched, just making everything sets itself up, so that you find yourself now in another sector, another phase of this theory, not the perturbative. Uh, and and, and, uh, uh, and again, it's a surprise. And if you're really clever, it's a hint, right? Because uh, four for me interaction, not four for me on interactions are good uh, uh, for weak interactions. Here's one that you can change at least in this particular phase of the theory, you can change into electromagnetism. Now at that time, of course, it was known that the weak interactions were V minus A, right? The vector currents. And we should have said, being infinitely wise, that uh, you could turn this model, uh, you could turn this model in, into uh, those models into things that look like vector interactions. But of course, no one was, and there would be a lot of work to do in, in, in doing the calculation. All right. Anyway, all this is a direct analog to this. And I saw this and I thought, despite the fact that Schwinger had shown that the masslessness of the photon really had nothing, everything to do with perturbation theory and nothing to do with any general uh, solution. I again showed my lack of wisdom by thinking, ah, Schwinger somehow's got it wrong. And there's got to be, a, because this theory is, is a, has a, absolutely, the way it stands, is force at a zero mass particle. Uh, there must be a similar theorem in electromagnetism. And I sort of thought I proved it, and I put it in my thesis, and Wally looked at it, scratched his head, and he said, yeah, leave it there. Big mistake. Those of you who remember Sidney Coleman was on my committee, and he 
we go through the thesis, and he starts asking questions. And he says, I don't know, Jerry, this is just wrong. Uh, and we argued, and I took the chapter out of the thesis. But uh, meanwhile, at Harvard, Wally, with another student, uh, Dave Bowler, had come up with a free model which looked like electromagnetism, but with an interaction with a scalar field that looks like what I've written on the board. And that, that had a degree of aging variance to conserve current and, and uh, uh, produce a massive particle, the Bowler Gilbert model. And if you took that uh, uh, together uh, with other things we knew at Harvard at the time, uh, in principle, you have the ingredients to uh, do the paper that, that Tom Dick and I did way back two years earlier. But, of course, again, we had the ingredients, but we didn't have the stove. Uh, so, I, went, I got an NSF postdoctoral fellowship and I went on to Imperial College and uh, met Tom and uh, we also immediately took a liking to each other. Tom and his wife Ann were wonderful and entertaining and talking to the postdocs and in fact everyone in Imperial College and it was just a, a very, very warm atmosphere. And even though they were generally sympathetic to uh, uh, public field theory or people who didn't believe what I was doing, Victor Ray Streeter, and I made an argument with Ray, produced an example that proved to him, even with rigor, there is a real, uh, uh, there, is, there are simple models that show you can have no symmetry, your axioms are wrong. He agreed with me, and I wrote a paper uh, showing the model of Sean Streeter, but slipped in this argument that, and now in proof, Version two of the wrong argument of why photons are masses, and that there is a boson theorem that forces it to be true, and that really was the key. Bowler picked up what was wrong. I picked up what was wrong. My colleagues picked up that it was wrong, and then we were in business. Uh, I'm embarrassed about it. Uh, we're going in order these talks from oldest to youngest. Let Hagen do the heavy lifting and talk about the equations. Uh, but I'll just say a little bit about after all of this, uh, my, uh, uh, I gave uh, some presentations and they were received with great skepticism. I went to a conference uh, along with Dick that Heisenberg uh, had organized uh, outside of Munich. I talked on this and I was really beat up. And Heisenberg, who obviously was incredibly smart man that should have known better told me what a bad physicist I was he proposes. He might have been right about the bad physicist, but the model was really right. But one nice thing about this conference, Julian Schwinger, who was there, didn't say a damn thing about the talk, but he said, I've got a nice new car that can walk with my Nobel Prize. And he took me for a ride in it. That's <laughs> sweet. Uh, so the Volga 300 horse power quarter engine, beautiful interior. But when I went for the ride, I ended up here because Mrs. Heller, who was there with, with her husband, saw us walking out the door and said, Oh, I want to hear this fancy new car that you see this fancy new car that you got, Julian. Are you guys going for a ride in it? He said, Yes. She came along, gets in it, we take off, and Julian was driving it very skillfully, and she looks at him and says, You know, Julian, in the United States, when we buy a car this expensive, it has an automatic transmission. <laughs> <laughs> I think I will end there. And